now I can work on it two times. Uh, I was the only one working on the game until January this year, and uh, now uh, I'm joined by another artist, and we're uh, we've doubled in size, uh, basically. But we also collaborate with some uh, um, uh, with some designer and music composer and uh, an animator on uh, on the side, and we're using our engine to do the game. The art, st art style. Um, so the game has a very stylized look. Uh, everything that's alive and everything that's organic has a smooth, uh, a smooth, smooth surface, and everything that's not alive, like uh, rocks and robots and stuff like that, that um, low poly faster, that has a low poly faster look. I think that getting, uh, I think getting the right um, polygonal look is harder than it seems, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into some uh, tips that we found useful while uh, researching, uh, researching the art style. We have no UVs and uh, no textures, almost, with the exception of the cloud and the uh, and effects. And that gives us a very fast, uh, very short loading time. However, we do have a high poly count because uh, each vertex is split to create the hard spot. But these days, uh, the GPUs are, are doing quite well um, crunching uh, poly, polygons. So I use Houdini for modeling, animation, and effects. Uh, animation is, my, is not my strongest skill, so I'll talk mostly about uh, modeling and effects in this, uh, in this talk. And these are some of the assets that uh, I've done using, uh, using Houdini. So we have a different workflow depending on the assets. We have uh, traditional poly modeling for smooth and uh, faster surfaces. We have uh, procedural modeling for uh, specific assets. And then we have uh, a workflow for, uh, for effects. So let's start with uh, poly modeling for smooth surfaces. And in this case, I'm going to go through modeling this guy. This is one of the first enemies you encounter. And these guys are pretty vicious. So if you're not careful, you're going to suffer a, a pretty painful death. Now, the workflow that I'm using is very similar to traditional box modeling. You know, Houdini uh, doesn't have the best reputation when it comes to organic modeling. And that maybe was true 10 years ago, um, but in, at least in, um, in, the, in the latest versions, they've done a lot of improvements to help artists create um, nice uh, organic, uh, organic uh, surfaces. So uh, um, right now I'm just going through, you know, creating the different uh, body parts, and you know I'm using all the standard uh, modeling tools that you'd expect um, in, a, in, a, in a modeling package. So. Um, so now I'm uh, just um, splitting the guy into, into different uh, sub-objects so I can assign a different material in, uh, in Unreal. Um, now, as you can see, Houdini can do quite well uh, when it comes to um, organic modeling. But we get some nice stuff for free from the, from the um, uh, procedural workflow. So for example, let's say I want to uh, replace the blue dots with, with something else. We just uh, swipe uh, changing a single node I can get something like this that you know can look a bit more aggressive, and everything else uh, stays the same. Just as easy it is to replace uh, the blue dots with you know smaller version of himself because you know why not? Uh, we can. So we have a great uh, flexibility, as you could see in uh, in the trailer. Uh, that was captured only from the first two levels, so we had to create we had to create a large amount of uh, props uh, very fast. And this iteration and this kind of prototyping, you know, it's, it's great for us because it allows us to quickly test, uh, test stuff. So here is the guy um, read and, uh, and animated. And as I said, I'm gonna skip over this part because it's not my strongest suit, but I still have to do it because this is the indie way, there's no one else to do it. Um, and I think it's pretty cool that even though I'm not, uh, you know, very experienced with it, I can still find my way in Houdini and I, I'm still able to do some, some animation and then, then some reading. So here is the guy in, um, in the game. As I said, they're, they're, they're pretty vicious. They're, they're, they're pretty, pretty, pretty dangerous guys. Um, and the fun fact, uh, the inspiration for these guys <coughs> came from a spider that I photographed in, in Thailand by uh, this guy. And I just think you can't beat nature. It's, uh, it's the greatest inspiration at all. All right, so that was the organic modeling. Now for the poly modeling uh, of uh, particle surfaces. So this is more like of our uh, signature look, uh, let's say. And this represents everything that is not alive, as, uh, as I said before. So the first part is very similar with how I modeled uh, the, the previous example, just um, traditional uh, poly modeling. 
until we get to something like this, which is our base, base shape. And as you can see, I'm not really worried about topology right now. So now I need to take this one and stylize it. So how do I do that? Well, first I need to subdivide the mesh. And I do this using um, ISO offset node in Houdini. And what this does is creating a very dense, fairly uniform, uh, uniformly subdivided mesh. So um, the next step is very important as well. You need to save this one to this because every time you're going to open Houdini, uh, every time you're going to open this thing, uh, Houdini is going to regenerate the mesh. It's going to look the same, but the um, vertex numbering or vertex ordering is going to be different. So that means that if after this operation you have something that relies on uh, vertex numbers, you know, it's not going to work properly. So save it to this, reopen it, and then you're, you're sure that it has the same, um, the same mesh uh, every time. So now we need to apply um, a high frequency noise modifier. This is called the mountain in Houdini. And I'm going to come back and show you why we need this uh, in a second. So after this, I'm using a poly reduction tool to get, uh, to, get to, the final, uh, to the final shape. Now, why do I need to apply a mountain modifier before, or a noise modifier before? It's because this is how it looks without it. Because we have a lot of flat, big areas, and the poly reduction tool is doing what's doing, what's supposed to do, and that's removing the polygon. Um, but in our testing, you know, we found that this Fetch polygons don't shade well, and they 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 don't um, they just don't, don't don't look good. So I much rather have something like this, where we kind of force the poly uh, poly reduction tool uh, to leave behind a bit more uh, a bit more polygons. So now that I have that, this is the time when I start to split the graph and create variations for the props. So in our game. Most of the assets uh, uh, is uh, damaged either by environment, uh, either by the passing of time or by, by war. So right here I'm using the um, break tool to cut some holes in, uh, in the mesh. The great thing about the break tool is that it's um, independent of topology. So uh, I can make some variations, and you can see at the end I'm, uh, I have something like this from, this, uh, from, uh, from one base, uh, this base mesh. The cool thing is that if I go back and you know, uh, make some changes, you know, make the years longer or whatever, um, everything will propagate nicely down, uh, down the graph and I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep all the variations, of course with the updated, uh, with the updated version. So this is how the graph looks in the end. Uh, on top, the red nodes are everything that uh, has to do with uh, polygon modeling, uh, extrusions, subdivisions, bevels, all the stuff. Then the blue nodes are um, the nodes that uh, subdivide the mesh, the noise, and the last one is um, the reduction. And here in the end, I'm getting all the, the versions uh, separated. So you can see I can make different, uh, different variations and different uh, operations on, uh, on each branch. And the nice thing is, of course, if I go back and I change something on top, it's all going to propagate nicely, nicely in the bottom. And here is the mesh, uh, here is the asset in, uh, in the game. And you can see, even though it has a lot of flat surfaces, it still gets some light, it still gets some details. And that is because uh, the noise modifier creates some small uh, ir irregularities in, uh, in the surface. So it catches some nice, uh, some nice light. And um, I think this uh, low poly style works great also for um, other props than just uh, angular, uh, angular items. So you can see this robot is made mostly from uh, curved surfaces, and I still think that uh, the low poly style fits, uh, fits this kind of um, this kind of props uh, well. So um, that was for the most traditional uh, modeling part. Now I want to talk about uh, a bit about the proced procedural modeling. So this might not look like much, but it's actually a pretty important asset in our game. This is the background star field uh, that you can see during night time. So um, traditionally in games, uh, the way you do um, a sky dome is you project a texture on a, on a sphere and that's it. Um, but in our game, we have a real time day and night cycle. And on top of that, at some point, the player will get the ability to change its uh, planet rotation to go forward and backwards. And that, that means that he can control the time of day. So we needed a nice effect to come along with that because you're going to do that quite a, uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. I'm going to show it to you in a second how it looks 
but it was important for us to get some parallax effects between uh, the stars. So that means we need a sky, uh, a sky dome that, that has a bit of that. So um, since we have a side scroller, um, we need uh, something that you know would work from uh, from one side. So if you imagine you go to uh, you uh, work toward you know kind of like 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 this way. And the first step is to define the volume where we're going to have the start. And this is a, cyl a cylinder in our case would work uh, would order just fine. So this is the volume where the start we're gonna we're gonna be placed. The next step is to use uh, the aptly named uh, points from <coughs> volume to fill the volume with, with points, and we get something like this. This one has a lot of options. We can easily decrease the number of points and all that. We can we can try uh, we can try different uh, different densities and, and stuff like that. So next we need to work on our star, and for now a simple plane will do will do just fine. The next step is to use the copy node, and the copy node copies or instantiates uh, the source to the point. So you can see I'm just getting the star, uh, the plane instantiated on, on, on every point. And the copy node is pretty awesome, uh, it's pretty awesome tool, it's super powerful and it can do a lot of stuff and we, we use it quite a lot. I'm just decreasing the numbers of stars a bit. So now we can start and randomize a bit the, uh, um, the look of, of the star. As I said, we're doing a lot of iterations, so it was important for us to have an easy way to Output, uh, you know, different versions from uh, from Houdini to, to our game and, and try them out. You know, we try different densities, different shapes, different, uh, um, uh, yeah, different um, sizes and, and all that. So right now I'm just randomizing a bit, um, a bit um, the look, uh, randomizing the rotation as well. Since we're side scroller, we only care about one axis, but it's equally simple to randomize the rotation um, for, uh, for for all axes. Now, let's say I want to go back and um, make a change, and let's say I need to unwrap uh, the stars so I can project the texture on them. So instead of unwrapping um, the mesh after it was, um, you know, copied over, I can just go back, unwrap the source, and then all the changes are going to propagate down. And you can see I kept everything else. Um, the number, the, the scale, and the rotation is all kept. So I can go in and change the source without destroying everything else after that I've done afterwards. Now, it would be cool if uh, the stars wouldn't have um, the same opacity. So what I needed um, was a way, uh, was a parameter that I could use inside the Unreal, inside the shader, a parameter that I could uh, drive the opacity with. So one of the easiest things uh, to transfer with uh, FBX is uh, vertex color. So that's what, I, what I'm going to use. So what I need is basically different vertex color for each of the stars to that I can then take inside the shader in Unreal and then and, and drive the opacity with. Uh, of course, if I assign a vertex color to the source, then all these stars are going to have the same um, values, which you know it kind of defeats uh, the purpose. Uh, but I, what I can do is afterwards I can add. So after I copy, I can add this called uh, it's called a point uh, node, and so, uh, with a very basic expression, I can randomize. The, um, the vertex color, and here I'm just picking the red color. I can, I can randomize the red color uh, over over the star, and I can have the green and blue for for something else. So as you can see, I have a nice random uh, uh, variation over over the star. Super simple is to change, um, you know, the uh, the star <laughs> trying different uh, trying different shapes. Um, just as easy it is to change the volume. Um, we can get something like this if we want, not that we uh, need it, but mm -hmm. it was just nice to have, um, to have the, the flexibility. So this is how, I how um, small the graph is, and it's all the, the last one. So the last one is what we have in game. It took us two minutes to set up, and then it offered us tons of flexibility and saved us a lot of time. So the red node is everything that has to do with uh, the source, which in our case is the stars. The green node uh, is what um, um, are for the volume, and then the copy node over here. And this is the point of that, that um, randomizes the color. So you can see just a few nodes, and um, and yeah, as I said, it, it, it saves us um, a lot of uh, a lot of time. 
So this is how the party looks uh, in the game. And also have a short video to show it to you in uh, But this is where you get the ability to change planet or something. So you can do something like like uh, like this. So I'm not sure how much you can see from the compression and the resolution, but you get um, a pretty nice uh, parallax effect when you when you do this. As I mentioned, we're gonna, you're gonna have to do this quite quite often in the game, so we need to have strong strong visual effects to to back this uh, back this up. Okay, so now of course we cannot talk about Houdini without going into effects, and this is gonna be super short. Um, so pretty early on in the game, I decided to have the clouds nice and fluffy. At the beginning, I was a bit worried that you know they might collide to. Um, too much with, uh, with, with the low poly style, but after doing a quick test, you know, I was sold on it, so I knew this is, this is what I wanted. Um, and uh, Houdini has some awesome cloud tools, and, um, and that, that, that's what I'm using. So I'm going to show you how easy this is. You start from a mesh like this, which is just polygon mesh where you can scatter the clouds. I just found that, you know, going with something um, irregular like this, you know, gives the best results. So after this, I'm just using the cloud tool, and the cloud tool is amazing. It has tons of options, tons of uh, parameters to randomize and to customize the looks. So, so with the cloud tool, you you uh, get something like this. Now, in our game, I wanted the cloud to be flattened at the bottom, and luckily, there's an option for that. So after this, you can use a noise cloud tool to get a lot more uh, detail in the game, in uh, in the cloud. So uh, as you can see, the clouds are starting to look um, pretty nice. Um, one tricky part was that um, the clouds in the game are basically just uh, textures mapped on a, um, on a plane, and we have this real-time day and night cycle, so that means that the clouds need to react naturally to the changes of, 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 of day and night, right? So at sunset and sunrise, they should get some uh, warm colors from where the sun is uh, setting and some cold colors from a from the opposite side, at night they should have a nice rim light from the moon and, uh, and all the stars. Um, so that means that we cannot tint the plane uniformly, uh, that wouldn't give you know, a very good result. So we needed a way to be able to tint different parts of, of the cloud independently. So this is just a fake lighting, and this is a trick that I learned back in the days in post, and in post it's called um, relighting post, and this is basically relighting uh, shade or whatever. So so it's, it's a fake lighting that we need to match with the real light, but I think the results are, uh, are pretty good. So that's it. I need a way to separate uh, the different uh, sides of, of the cloud. And for that, I'm going to use three lights, the red, the green, and the blue one, that I'm going to spread across um, spread across the cloud. And this is what I'm getting out of Houdini. This is the stuff that I'm bringing in, uh, in Unreal. By the way, it's really easy to make custom-shaped <laughs> clouds. Um, I'll go back to all. So, I'm getting um, these guys, I'm getting them in Unreal. So now I'm inside the shader, and now I'm splitting uh, the components. I'm separating the components, the red, the green, and the blue components. And this is the red, this is the green, and this is the blue. So using this one, in the shader, what I can do, I can tint each of them independently, and I can use uh, some logic from the game to find out which color should be should be should be where. So as you can see the clouds, even though they're not lit by the same light that that lights the environment and lights all the top, you know they still look like part of uh, they still look fairly integrated part of uh, part of the same uh, part of the same environment. So uh, you know different different uh, <coughs> um, different colors uh, based on on the time of day. And you can see at night we have a nice soft uh, soft rim light. <coughs> so I also have a short video to show you how it looks in a, when we when we change um, the time of day. And this is very customizable so I can go and I have a lot of artistic freedom to go and pick the colors as I, as I want. Uh, that was really important for us to keep uh, my talk. Uh, if there's
there's one thing that I'm happy uh, that Houdini provides for us is uh, flexibility and quick, quick itera uh, itera iteration. iteration. Uh, we're able to to get um, assets quickly in the game, and then you know we can uh, iterate uh, iterate on them. Um, and yeah, I mean there's there's a lot more to, to 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 talk about it, but um, that's basically that's basically uh, it. Thank you. Thank you. 